All right, welcome back to episode 13 of the Night Report podcast. Uh, joining me is co-host Richie Schneiderite. Richie, pretty awesome week for Rutgers basketball, one of the biggest moments in Rutgers sports history. We also just had signing day yesterday. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, um, definitely a huge game on Thursday and not so big of a game on Sunday. But uh, yeah, up and down. Uh, roller coaster season, kind of like football, I guess, a little bit. For sure. But uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever, not ever, but I don't think there's been a Rutgers sports moment that's been as viral as that shot since mm -hmm. probably the Louisville game in 2006. Pro, yeah, probably, actually. Um, cover of, like, New York Post, like, all over. I, yeah, media. I couldn't believe it. it. It went completely viral between you saw Ron on Barstool, you saw Ron on ESPN, you saw Ron on this and that, and the back cover of New York Post, like you said. Um, it was literally, like, as people were calling it, like, the shot heard around the world. It's probably the biggest moment in college basketball so far this season. Um, yeah. If it stays the biggest, who knows? There's probably going to be a bunch of crazier moments between – programs left and right um it happens every year but this this is probably um it's an interesting one this might be one of the biggest things of what, that will happen this season yeah and it's interesting how much coverage it would have gotten if purdue was like the number three team versus the number one team i think it just carried that extra weight because of the number one next to their name for that game even if it was short-lived but yeah i know it, it does it does kind of suck that they had a game a couple days later and Maybe if they won, it would have got a little more coverage, but they kind of just died after that 48 hour span. Yeah, and it's a tough turnaround to go from, you know, such a tough opponent to your biggest rival in 48 hours. Uh, Hell, I mean, that schedule in general is Clemson, Illinois, Purdue, Seton Hall. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, I don't know if you can say anyone else has had a harder four game stretch than Rutgers in that little span. That's true. Um, and it's, it's a shame if we got that kind of, that kind of performance from Ron each week, each night. Like we'd be like that's the kind of thing the offense needs is he needs like an alpha that's just willing to like kind of take the ball and score in tough situations like Ron did that whole game like like a Jacob Young type like a Jacob Young yeah somebody who's got a little attitude to them and isn't uh, afraid and just geez. willing to kind of go down and get a bucket when he knows his team needs it because um, we were down in the second half for a lot of that game like we had to fight and claw back and, yeah. That's why, like, um, I don't know if you, you watched the whole scene hall game, but they started to claw back a little bit. Like, they were down, I want to say, 10 and a half, and then all of a sudden it got down to 14 at one point, and then all of a sudden Rutgers got it within six, and I was like, holy shit, they're going to do it again. Like, Yeah, I did see the majority of that game. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it was just a, a, the scene hall game was a big letdown because I, yeah. I thought they didn't really play that well. I don't know if it was the crowd – that was because that was the first like big game atmosphere that they've had against them this year. Oh yeah. I mean, easily 80% of Seton Hall fans in that arena. I know um, there are respects of red, of course, I think the riot squad had their biggest turnout ever around like 90 to hundred people. Um, there were scattered red shirts throughout, but I, I got to give Seton Hall credit. They, um, they did show up. Their student section was loud as could be on a Sunday night. Um, they bust them in. I mean, it did. They're a very good team this year and they're going to make a run in the tournament. Yeah, that dude, uh, Aiken, was just, like, a, an assassin. And I know he was a transfer from Harvard, I believe. He was, yeah. he was a good guy. It's a shame that, you know, we're not really seemingly going after – we didn't really go after any transfer – like, impact transfers last year. I think that will probably change this offseason. Yeah, I mean, it kind of has to at this point. Given the, the, the recruiting struggles. And yeah. I, I kind of want to talk about that because we lost a kid to Dayton the other night. That guy – Mongolian Mike and yes. this has kind of just been a running thing if, if guys have other offers they really just kind of don't end up going to Rutgers like Rutgers finishes in second place a lot but mm -hmm. what do you think it is about Pike and his recruiting that he seems to struggle consistently uh the for example for Mike it was kind of interesting because they showed so much interest early on when they offered him it was like they pushed them a lot. I know I've talked to coaches that were like, oh, wow, Rutgers is like really pushing this kid. They really, really want him. The head coach um, over at ISA where Mike plays, there uh, actually was Caleb McConnell's head coach. So there's a very familiar, there's a familiarity factor between Pykele and the coaching staff in general. Um, I know after talking to their coach, like the Dave Brisky, the head coach of ISA over there, he's, he's very high on Mike. He thought Rutgers was going to land him from the get-go. And then uh, in the end, they, they, uh, Dayton was the only – he was – yeah, I can't talk today. Jeez. He was Dayton's only 2022 offer from wow. what I was told, and they just kicked the tires on him and eventually ended up landing him. And 
it's kind of ironic because I thought I reached out to Brisky this week saying like, Hey, I know you guys are playing in New Jersey. You're playing in Elizabeth on Friday. Any chance that uh, they're playing in some big tournament in Elizabeth on Friday, any chance that like Pike and all of them are going to come watch or like, what's the deal there? And he's like, Oh, he's committing to Dayton tomorrow. I was like, Oh, all right. never mind." <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> okay. Very weird. I don't know where the hell that one came from, but sure. Um, yeah. Cause I was really going to go watch the kid. I probably still will just cause He's such an intriguing player. And that program is probably going to be, as long as Brisky is the head coach and the connection he has with Pike, that program's probably going to get Rutgers offers from time to time. But um, yeah, recruiting wise, it's interesting because they're probably going to have upwards of four or five open scholarships and they've only filled two so far. Now, don't get me wrong. I like Derek Simpson a lot. I think Wolf Folk's an intriguing prospect as a project. He's got a long way to go though. And I don't care what anyone says. He will be the big man here. He will be a big, like a center. He's 6'9", like 250, 260 area. He will be a center. I know people don't like hearing 6'9", center or 6'8", center, but it's, it's the future of the game. Look at Bam Adebayo. Look at, um, there's, there's a list of them. I just can't pull them up right now. Paul Millsap is another one. Uh, but regardless, Pike likes guys that fit his system. Um, and he's very like particular with that. You're never going to land these top 100 kids consistently because everyone knows at the end of the day, and it's, it's been made very public now with NIL, these guys are getting paid. There's no yeah. secret about that. If you're taught and, and hoops recruiting is the slimiest of them all. So if you think football is getting a shit ton of money, I can bet you money that these, I can bet you anything in the world that these top 50 kids in hoops are getting bags of stuff. And now it's just like, oh, yeah, it's an NIL deal. Here you go. Sign it off. Like, it's a hell, it's a tax write-off at this point. Yep. But, yeah, so I, I don't know what they're going to do with these open scholarships. I know you have to hit the portal. After watching Sunday's performance against a team that didn't have their best big man in, in Seton Hall get dominated in the, on the boards, it's, it's like clear as day that they need a backup center badly. Yeah. Um, Cliff will be here another year, but a G is not the answer. You don't have another center on a team that's capable of playing big minutes. Reber's not the answer. He didn't even play a single minute in the game. Well, in, in the Purdue game, they were throwing Nathan, uh, Luke Nathan out there before they were throwing AG. And that might have just been to, like, go in there and make sure that the their center didn't score, just foul him. Like, yeah. just you got to soak up some fouls. But and, I was surprised he went in there before AG on, in, against Purdue. I think I, – and I hate to say – I hate to knock the guy because he's such a nice dude, but he he's so bad on the court. Like, he looks clueless. Um there's, there was one play on Sunday, and I forget if it was Caleb or if it was Gio, a real nice drive. Then the two, the center and the guard collapsed on Gio when he drove, and he hit like, uh, he went to hit AG like around, it was either G, I think it was Caleb actually. He went to hit like around the back pass to a uh, uh, cutting AG, and AG just like didn't even think it was coming to him, and it just hit him and fell. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, like, and then on top of it, you had zero rebounds. Like, you had one fucking job. You hyped up all offseason long. Now you're the best offensive rebounder on this team. I don't even care if you get zero offensive boards. You had zero boards in general. Yeah. It's it's bad. They need a backup center so, so bad. You can't be putting Cliff out there for 30 minutes. Um, he's also got to learn to box out quite a bit. He need, His basketball IQ is not there yet. Um, he will be back for another year. I can almost guarantee that one. Uh, the people that um, – I know – Jaden Jones didn't play a ton. I think he played two minutes. He was, uh, he's not injured, but he wasn't healthy. He had the flu apparently like everyone else on the team. Um, Jalen Miller, pretty impressive. I know he didn't put up any really, really good stats or anything like that. Didn't stuff stat sheet, but very impressive performance. Did a good job guarding uh, Aiken from time to time. I know Aiken went off. You can't really guard a 36 foot three pointer. <laughs> Yeah, he just hit, he would just take those so casually and just can it. He was it's, it he wiped was out on Sunday. He, he's such a good player and um, went healthy. That that was a big thing in the first Seton Hall last year. He wasn't healthy at all. Um, they did a really re Caleb McConnell. I got to give hats off to him. Damn near yeah, double double at halftime. I'm so proud of him. And and he's embracing that new role, like that Swiss Army knife role. Like damn a near double double at halftime. Held Jared Rode into two points at halftime. Jared Roden's averaging like 18, 19. Mind you, he did go off in the second half a little bit. I think he scored 14 in the second, which it is what it is. I mean, but at the end of the day, they had a hell of a performance from him. Um, the more and more I look at the stat sheet, though, it's it's becoming increasingly well known that Rutgers can't shoot the three. Never could, to be honest, if we want to really go that far. 
free throw shooting has been a hell of a lot better, which is which is impressive. Whatever. Yep. Um, Gio and Ron, if they're not sh- making any type of shots, I think they you got to cut their shots like in, in half. You can't have those two your star players go seven of twenty three. Come on, like that's less than thirty percent. Like that's it's putrid. It's awful. But uh, I, I don't know. Something's got to change. Someone else has to take shots. Paul okay, he like shits his pants when he gets like a wide open shot and just passes it or just dribbles. He had a couple wide open attempts that he could have had and just didn't take them. He's way too hesitant on um, on shooting. Watt Mag had a good game, although he's another one who I think could be really good, but his body control needs to be fixed so badly. There was one play where uh, me and Fonseca were talking about it in the press area. He ran down the court. I, I think it was a turnover on somebody. He ran down the court, caught up with one of the guards or Richmond, I think it was, or Kale, I forget who it was. Fully caught up to him only to almost steamroll. <laughs> and if he could just figure out like how to like his body a little bit in terms of like controlling himself, then he could be a hell of a defender and a very, very good player for this team. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed. Andre Hyatt hasn't been there. He hasn't been good. Um, he struggled. Um, and it, it kind of goes to show you maybe the portal isn't always the answer, but then you look at Seton Hall and it's like, oh, shit, look at all those portal guys killing it. It's like, all right, maybe the portal is the answer. Like, yeah, I think it's all the balance. You got to find the right guys to fit your system, like you were saying, and you got to be able to like be a good self-scout and understand where your deficiencies are and yeah. really just recruit for that. And not, I, I don't know, you have to be honest with yourself and where the team is at. Because it feels like from what we've heard in the media from Pike, I don't know if he's being fully honest with himself with where the team is at right now. Yeah, I think he's got to just kind of own up and kind of say, yep, we suck. Like, we pretty much suck. Like, it is what it is. Um, I know after talking to former players, they said it's always, it's always like, Pike's not just like that on press conferences. He always is that Mr. Nice Guy. He'll always try to coach him up. He'll always be very, like, complimentary of guys no matter what they do and um i think at some point you got to show your mean streak you got to show your mean side and everything like that and just kind of say like what the fuck are we doing like we are a a tournament team we just beat yukon we beat villanova and we lost the fucking lafayette are you kidding me yeah and to their credit i mean they just did beat the number one team in the country like you got to give them all the props in the world for that so it doesn't look like they're improving I hate to be that guy and like kind of like knock them down for that win. But if you look at the stat blast I put out the other day between, and it's just showing comparing like little stats, like bench points, points in the paint, um, all that, all that good stuff against uh, Purdue. They had no reason to be in that game whatsoever. It was so bad. They got dominated in the paint. It was 36 to 28 in the paint. The bench Rutgers bench scored five points in that game. If Ron doesn't go off there, they lost um yeah. what else I'm, so bench points comparison five to 31 second chance points four to 22 points off turnovers four to 16 and it's like holy shit how the hell did they win this game i know i mean i'll take it but i know I, i'm not like you can't knock it too much they got out rebounded by eight it's just it was the, the steel differential was two to eight like it's it was wow. such a bad game stat wise and they fucking won yeah and they, they really did get dominated in the paint. Like, that guy Trevion Williams for Purdue, like, oh, he's he, disgusting. he was just able to get whatever shot he wanted, and it didn't even seem like he had much touch. Like, there was three or four shots that he made where he just, like, threw it as hard as he could off the backboard, and it, like, went right in, like, it banked in. It, it was it was impressive, but, yeah, he was most of their bench. He had the 21 points off their bench. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't tell you, by the way. We got a comment on our thing, and I just realized I keep doing it a lot. Um, we got a comment on our YouTube last week saying, uh, stop the cursing. So yeah, stop and I just cursed about like 32 times. So we're going to have to put like a little exclaimer at the, at the beginning somewhere. All right. I'll try and, uh, use my, I'll no, 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 I don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just... Oh, YouTube itself told you to do that. No, 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 no. Like some random fan. Got it. Yeah. I think we're just going to have to put an exclaimer and be like, Hey, we, uh, we curse on this podcast quite a bit. <laughs> I, I do at least, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I do occasionally. Yeah, um, so we've had some news the last couple of days uh, that has been pretty favorable for Rutgers, I guess. I mean, losing Kobe Reader kind of sucked because it seemed like he was we had, we were his best offer for a while, and then he ended up visiting Kansas State and Iowa State last yeah. week during the week. He ended up committing to Iowa State. Uh, yeah. I guess talk a little bit about that and how that came together because it did seem 
like we were in the lead for the a little bit there. Yeah. Um, he, he's an interesting kid. I know um, after talking to him, he was pretty high on Rutgers. He liked the idea of it. Ooh, excuse me. He wanted to play big time football. Um, he knows the Rutgers staff is pretty familiar with him as Joe Susan was actually his first offer for him back at Bucknell. But at the end of the day, he kind of told me midweek, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go visit Kansas State and Iowa State. And I, I don't really have a preference on location. I just want to try to get to that next level if I can. And that was like, all right, well, there it goes. He's not coming. So nice kid, though. Super, super good kid. I actually think he's going to dominate at Iowa State. And they're, they're a very good program, too. It's not like they're like some nobody program. Like Matt Campbell has had them top 10, I think, at one point this year. They're a really good team, and they're gonna they're gonna make some noise this year too. But it, they, it is what it is. Lot, they lose Brock Purdy, who's like a four year starting quarterback. They lose Brees Hall. Like, yeah. they they are a well run program, though. I I hundred percent agree. But that kind of leads me to the the next linebacker. We've kind of identified him a while ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff Arku or Kate and Arku. He's a Syracuse linebacker. He got yeah. his Rutgers offer, I believe, yesterday. Uh, you guys have been saying on the board you feel pretty good about him. You want to talk a little bit about him and where we sit in his recruitment? Yeah, so I actually talked to him yesterday, and um, we, we actually – it was kind of a different interview for a change. Like, it's cool to talk to the transfers because it's more or less not just, like, excitement about the offer and all this. It's more like kind of shooting the shit. So we went back and forth um, talking about the linebacker room, and he's like, he's like, I want someone's opinion on, like, how many people are there, like, what happened. I know, like, four guys left. I know like what the coaches say, but I want, I want to hear your opinion. I'm like, dude, I'm not getting involved in this one yeah. and not trying to piss off anybody, but we are pretty confident that uh, he is going to end up at Rutgers. He's um, an intriguing prospect. Um, from what I know, he didn't get as much playing time this year at Syracuse. He didn't start any games, which is weird. Cause like 2020, he started nine of their 10 or not 10 yeah. of their 11, whatever it was. I think it was 10 of 11. And then this year he played in all 10, but he didn't start any. So when I was, um, when I was originally looking up him when he first entered the transfer portal, I, I read up a, f- a thread on Syracuse as like a running thread of all their transfers out on yeah. their Syracuse fan site. And a lot of people were pretty annoyed he was transferring because he was like their fourth linebacker. He played a lot, like you said. He was projected to be a starter next year for them. And they were kind of wondering like why this guy would leave given that he knew he was going to be playing a lot. So it just seems like yeah. – that program's kind of in a, a free fall. If you, I think they, they have the most transfers in the portal right now of any power. They, they are leading for what we like to call at, on Rivals the Portal Cup. <laughs> I think we actually will be awarding um, a team. Like, probably put out an article. Probably won't, like, legitimately give them an, a trophy. But I think they're first place in the Portal Cup, which is uh, – it, it's not good. <laughs> no, it's not a good distinction to have. Yeah. It's now, different if you're, like – a new coach coming in and guys leave, but this guy, Dino Babers has been there, what, for five, six years. He, he was, he got, uh, so the same year Ash became the head coach at Rutgers was the year that Dino Babers became the head coach at Syracuse. So. Yeah. I don't understand how you go from an 11 win program to like, what was it last year? Like two wins or something. Yep. A one win. Yeah. So you went from 11 win or 10 wins, five wins, one win, five wins. I guess you're kind of bouncing back a little bit. I don't know. Their offense is really bad, and they they had some experience at quarterback, and they lost one of them. And now it seems like Illinois is basically turning into uh, New Jersey's leftovers. I hate to say it like that, but like Art Skowski, Tommy DeVito, then it just took like three random kids out of New Jersey this year, and it's like, well, they got Devin Leary too, or Don- Donovan Leary yeah. brothers, who I like as a prospect but he's like an old school quarterback the kids got cinder box and that's why his recruitment kind of didn't take off but yeah so anyway going back to Canton R2 I don't understand why he didn't play that much like if you look at his numbers he had like 60 something tackles in a weird weird season during the COVID year he had four sacks like a forced fumble a fumble recovery and a fumble and one of that fumble recovery was for like a 40 or 50 yard touchdown like he's a decent player it doesn't make sense to me but yeah. um, he met with Rutgers twice already, and he didn't meet with the head coach. He talked to the head coach in person, Greg Schiano. He met with Bob Frazier twice. Um, Frazier is usually in charge of the uh, recruiting Canadian players, so it makes a lot of sense. He, um, I think he'd be the third Canadian on the team at this point if he joined with Conga and Bailey. I don't think – Renee technically was on the team, but he's done. He's out of eligibility. Mm-hmm. Um, 
he's he's an interesting kid. They they need some experience at linebacker. It's clear as day that the young kids are probably going to have to step up for at least one of those positions if they're going to keep running this nickel type defense, but or four two five, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I do expect Powell to be one of those starters. I think Kyrie Benton's not there yet, but he will play significant snaps because they literally don't have anyone else. Yep. Um, Moses Walker might be able to play early on. He's got the frame already. He just needs I'd, a little bit more muscle. I'd be shocked if he red shirts next year. He's, he's just he's so talented. It's ridiculous. Um, Anthony Johnson is going to be an inside backer eventually. I don't know if he'll play year one. I think you probably try to reshape his body a bit. I think he's listed at six. I don't know what height was, but I know it was 240 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, he needs to kind of just, yeah, it's such a tough role because like we, everyone like that has ever covered Rutgers or followed Rutgers knows Shiano likes to bump guys down every yep. chance he gets. So it's tough. Like him at 240 right now is like so close to being that defensive end. Like, and it, they got to do something there. As of right now, they did list him at linebacker. So I was a little intrigued by that one. Whether it stays that way, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, anyway, the, the linebacker room should be interesting. I think Ken Arku could, I know people are saying he'll be a rotational backer, but he, he's probably your starter. Like, I hate to say it. He is. Yeah, I agree. It's like guaranteed to start this. He's got some good uh, length and he's, he's pretty athletic. So I, I, I don't think, I don't think it'd be undeserved if he came in and started right away. I think he's, he's got the, the pedigree to do so. Um, yeah. And this year's going to be interesting. I know talking to people there, they know it's going to be a tougher year. The schedule gets a lot tougher. I think Nebraska comes to town or they go to Nebraska, one of the two. Yep. Um, and that's not, that's not a bad big 10 program. I know their record kind of looks like shit, but they're, they're pretty good. Um, did Adrian Martinez return or he's transferring? I think, right? He's transferring. It sounds like he's going to, I mean, last time I heard, he sounds like he's going to end up at Kansas state. Uh, yes. His girlfriend goes there, I believe, or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, Nebraska comes to town. Um, they play a tough Boston college team, which is going to be an interesting game because I think that's the opener as of right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you got an easy one against Wagner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It get much softer than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, other than that, Minnesota like gets on the schedule. They're a good team. Um, Iowa, like the big the Big Ten did them no favors this year with the uh, Big Ten West opponents. It's Nebraska, Minnesota, Iowa, and they're all good teams. I think Iowa's probably ranked still, if I recall. Um, I guess you get your three out of conference wins. You would think maybe not. Actually, that's not even a guarantee this year with Boston College. That's a tough game, especially on the road early in the season. Road, home opener. Um, Jeff Halfley's got them looking actually pretty damn good. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I really don't know. That's going to be interesting. If you start 2-1, and one, it's not the worst. It's more or less you have – oh, wow. Yeah, this is actually really tough. Yeah. <laughs> in the end of the season, they're just kind of like what they always do. They're always a – Big Ten's kind of like, fuck you, Rutgers. Here's Iowa, Michigan State, Michigan, Penn State, back-to-back-to-back-to-back. To back to back to back. Yeah, I think – I think Ohio State's like always our first Big Ten game too, so that's that's the ultimate like like in the face there. It's like welcome to the league, guys. Every year, yeah. Ohio State last weekend in September. Enjoy it. <laughs> and it's gonna hurt attendance numbers this year too, or 2022, just because you're playing at SHI November 5th, November 19th, November 26th. It's gonna be cold. It's gonna be cold. It's gonna be cold. And you're playing against top tier opponents. The record's probably not the prettiest. You might have three wins going into that stretch. Three, four, yeah, three, four wins going into that stretch. And it doesn't look like you're probably going to win another game at that point. So that's a, well, who knows? Maybe Gavin Wimstad's the reincarnation of uh, Jesus himself. Well, let's all hope for our, our fanhood sake. Um, I did want to rip through the, the remaining transfer offers just to hear your perspective on these guys. Yeah. The Willie Tyler we offered a couple weeks ago, he took a visit. He's also visited, uh, I think it was SMU last weekend. What are you hearing about him? Yeah, so Rhett Lashley is the new coach at SMU. I think he's a Texas native, too. Um, he's been doing a really good job just in a, a week or so he's been there. Uh, maybe two weeks. I forget what it is exactly. But uh, it sounds like Willie Tyler, who played at Texas, is probably going to end up back in Texas with SMU. Um, he's a guy Rutgers liked. They wanted him to play left tackle. They were probably going to bump Raekwon inside, although they'll probably never admit that. Um, yeah, it sounds like he's all, all but SMU bound. Um, who was the other one you mentioned? 
I'm just going to, I'm just reading through your article. Oh, okay. There you go. Then yeah. Yeah. Offered, which is a shame about yeah. Tyler because we should be winning recruiting battles against SMU at this point, but it is what it is. Transfer yeah. Game. I mean, the ties to Texas are kind of like, I think what sold him there. It's clear as day. Like he liked Texas. He wanted to be in Texas. So let him go to Texas. Next offeree is Miles Frazier. This one, we don't really have to spend much time on. He released this top three. I think it was Florida State, mm-hmm. LSU, and uh, Ohio State. Yep, and he's deciding today. Um, I don't know when this is going to be released because he's deciding in 20 minutes. So it's probably LSU from what I heard. Um, the secondary option would be um, Florida State. And then Ohio State jumped in late and they made his top three, but it doesn't sound like he's going to end up there. But uh, everything points to LSU right now. Yeah, that, was, that one got away from us quick. I don't think we ever really stood a chance there. Would have been I, nice to, to land the kid, but. Yeah, hate to say I said so, but. <laughs> Yep. And then the last offeree that we know of, at least, uh, was one that came a day or two ago, <clears throat> Tremon Shorts from Eastern Tennessee State. Uh, he's got great PFF grades. He's got one year of eligibility. I believe he was playing left tackle for them. What do you hear about him? Um, I actually talked to him a little bit the other day, and he, he was going back and forth with me. He was kind of just same thing, which is kind of cool with transfers. They all kind of shoot the shit with you. He's like, I've only been in the portal for two days, and this shit is wild. Like, that was his quote unquote over the phone. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's. It's pretty accurate. I can imagine. Um, he's gotten so many offers. I don't see Rutgers being a player here. Um, he's gotten Nebraska, Virginia. And I'm just looking through it now. Uh, Rutgers, Colorado, a bunch of no names, like Power Five, not Power Fives, Texas Tech. Um, I know some SEC schools are starting to sniff around him. And if the longer he stays in the portal, the more likely he is probably going to snag one of those SEC offers. Um, even like you could see teams like Ohio State are hitting the portal too for offensive linemen. It's it's going to be a huge transfer up for him from Eastern Tennessee State, but all the way up to uh, Big Ten or SEC level. But it's more than likely going to end up at one of the Blue Bloods, if I had to guess. Um, he's he's a good player, but I just don't see Rutgers being a factor here. Yep, and I think that's kind of I, I wrote a post about this how. You know, Rutgers is recruiting well in the high school ranks because they can sell a vision. Like these mm-hmm. kids buy into what Chiano projects the program to do in four, five, six years. But yeah. for these transfer guys, I mean, they're looking for three things. They're looking for playing time. They're looking right. for a path to the NFL. And they're looking to play for a winning program. And, I mean, we could offer playing time. But, I mean, how many guys have we put in the NFL the last 10 years? How many times have we had a winning season? That's that's the big argument there. And on, on top of that, I, I kind of – the more and more you see it, Rutgers isn't sending out many transfer offers. It's clear as day Greg wants to build this via the high school route, kind of develop your own guys, kind of make them uh, – build them up into good players and make the program based off something like that. I know I was looking at some crazy stats, although Michigan State might be the outlier here. Building a team based off transfers alone, whether it's hoops or football, isn't always the answer. Hoops is a little different because you can kind of build around that just because there's like five, well, two or three players on a hoops team makes a difference. Two or three players on a football team isn't going to make that difference. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, looking at the numbers bef- the yesterday or the day before, I was looking at it, and most teams that, teams that have had the most transfers oh, hasn't always translated to success either. Michigan, like I said, Michigan State's the outlier there. But then again, you also have to think like, Greg walked into a program that has been in the shitter for I don't know how long. Yeah. Mel Tucker walked into a program that had Mark D'Antonio or Mark D'Antoni as the head coach who was one of the best in Big Ten history, like recruiting for them. Like it's not like they didn't have talent. Yeah, they had like one losing season in like the last 10 years. Like he exactly. went to a Rose, he won a Rose Bowl and he went to the CFP in mm-hmm. the last like eight years. Like this is a program that was built and stable for a long time under yeah. him. Now sprinkle in me now that program that's already been pretty damn good, sprinkle in a quarterback transfer and a running back transfer. You get Michigan State, who's got 10 wins or nine yeah. wins, whatever it is. Yeah, and I mean, everything is a calculated risk from the, the portal. Like, you could be as certain as you could ever be about a guy, and then he shows up 20 pounds heavier than he used to be. Or, like, yeah. there's so many factors that can go into things that, I mean, just because you land a couple guys from the portal you like doesn't mean that they're going to work, they're going to work out. It's just. Well, I mean, look, for example, look at Rutgers transfers Christian Braswell, Terrace ACL. Um, Patrice Renee might be the worst transfer of all time. Um, <laughs> who was the other one? They had someone else. David Nwagu is third string, second string O-line, and he started multiple games at Temple. Um, Ethan yeah, Maje kind of picked it up and so that, that was kind of a win. And you get him for another year, so I, I think that would be actually probably the one win they got in the transfer portal this offseason. 
Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I'm sure that we're going to keep going into this as more guys enter the portal. It's starting to pick up. There's been a few uh, follows the last couple of days that I haven't written up, but I'm going to plan mm -hmm. to do that later today. Um, there is one news item I wanted to talk about every guy from the high school recruiting class, but there's one more thing I wanted to kind of touch on before we get into that. Okay. Uh, Rand Brown seemed like he was gone for a little while. Uh, he sounded like he was going to be the, the next head coach Temple. Thankfully, that is not what ended up playing out. Uh, how close to the brink were we there? Um, he was top two and he wasn't one. So, <laughs> so basically, uh, Stan Drayton ended up winning in the, winning the job in the end. I know Fran met with the president of Temple and met with the AD of Temple. So it was that close to happening. Like based on everything we heard, like it sounded like on Tuesday, Fran was going to be it. Like he, people around the program. I actually had a coach from, um, uh, not power five, a G five, not even G five FC FCS school. That's what it was. And a coach from an FCS school actually called me and he's like, yo, Fran just called me. And I'm like, what? He goes, I'm like, when did he call you? Did he call you today? He goes, no, he called me a couple weeks ago. I'm like, oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> uh, he's like, yeah, he called me a couple weeks ago. He said he's in the running for the temple job. He wants to know if I'd be interested. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Like you got the Jersey ties and all that, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, that'd be cool. That actually kind of, kind of cool. Like not that I cover temple or really care, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's stuff like that. Connections like that, that kind of help out. Um, so Fran was very much in it. He was telling people and started building a staff too. Like it's clear as day. I know there's a running back coach at a G5 level that he reached out to in terms of staffing and all that. So, I mean, he was very, very close to getting this job and Greg was very supportive from what I've heard about this. Like it's, it's a head coaching job at the end of the day. You can't say no to that. Would they yeah. compete against each other? Sort of. Yeah. Kind of like they would have been playing against each other. Yeah. But end of the day, I don't think that who, no matter who the coach is, unless they're putting a staff of Fran Brown, Elijah Robinson, and who's the next best Jersey recruiter. I don't even know. And Chris Partridge together, then they're, they're never going to compete with Rutgers. I don't think. Yeah. And, and, and as much as it would have sucked to lose him, like it really is like a great feather in uh, Greg's cap when he's trying to recruit course. talented coaches over because mm -hmm. I mean Fran did take a, a chance at Rutgers because we were in a kind of a, a mess but I guess he just really wanted to learn under Shiano but he sends yeah. a guy who's been a coach at like a losing program to a head coaching job in the G5 like mm -hmm. people notice that people want to be able to yeah. move up like that's what most coaches aspire to be they want to be a head coach too so yeah I mean he did it during his first tenure look at PJ Fleck and Mario Cristobal and there was a third one I can't think of I think uh, Jeff Halfley, duh. Yep. There, there you go. There's and it would have just been a fourth head coach in his little cap, and it would have been like, all right, well, I did it the first time. I'm doing it again. Here we go again. Like, yeah, and that's so important because there's always going to be turnover. Like we've kind of been lucky to have no coaches leave the first two years of his his uh, his reign here. Yeah. Two point oh reign. It's just the way college football works. Um, so you need to be able to replenish your your coaching staff, and it always helps when you can show. It's kind of like putting a kid in the NFL. Like you show that, you know, what we're doing here works and what you're doing here will get you to where you want to be in your, your career. Yeah. I mean, look at his tweet the other day. He, he was talking about Kassan Abram. He went from third string when Fran got there and now he's first team all PFF. And it's like the guy, the guy probably was your best cornerback this season. And it's insane. Sure. So we'll see. But um, we did put together a list of guys that oh, yeah. in case Fran did leave, we were very close to it. There's some intriguing names out there. Um, I'm more intrigued to see if what happens with the DC spot. Like I heard a couple of rumors that Rob Smith might just be staying on and it wasn't the worst in the world, I guess. I guess the defense could have been a lot worse. Like it had it ups and it had its really bad downs, but you can kind of blame that on talent and Trey Avery and <laughs> a couple others. But um, it, it'd be interesting to see if he, if they keep him on board or not. Um, if not, I guess Fran would be a candidate technically, but ideally you probably want to make a splashy hire. Yep. Um, I don't, I kind of just peeked at a couple of names out there connected to Greg and I, I don't know. I don't know if there is like a splashy hire out there, but. I think the one that would have made the most sense, I don't know if this guy actually had a direct connection to Greg. I don't know if they have any overlap, but Penn State just got an awesome DC hire in Manny Diaz. That would have been an awesome, awesome hire if, if Shiano had the opportunity. Uh, I, I don't know if they coached together in Miami at all or Yeah, or I, I don't think they did. It would have been an interesting one, though, if um, they – I don't think Manny Diaz would have taken it. But, I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, he took Penn State. But um, the only name that would kind of bring, like, 
some kind of uh, name recognition at Rutgers would be Campanelli. And he didn't, it didn't seem like he was going to take it the first time. And that's kind of why we're at with Rob Smith. Mm -hmm. Um, But with Miami, I would have said like five weeks ago, I would have been like, oh, I camped easily. He would have left my, anyone left Miami, I guess, at that point. And then all of a sudden, Tua turned it on and it looks like that staff is staying put. One fast games, I think. What'd you say? I think they're on a five game winning streak. Yeah. So it's like, all right, shit. Like, here we go. And like, Miami's actually pretty good. So. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if another name I kind of like thought was interesting was Randy Shannon, the former, I, I don't know if he's still at UCF, is he? Yeah, where's he at now? Um, he's the co linebacker or co DC slash linebackers coach at um, Florida State. Everything going on there, I'd want the hell out too. Oh my God. That was, we could touch on that for a minute. That, that, what that's a steep on signing day, man. Did you, so, you obviously talked to a lot of people in the industry. What what the hell happened there? Um, basically, it, it's just it's funny as hell the way it went down. It's just because like in the morning, I think it was in the morning or late night before signing day. It was like, oh, we're gonna give Norvell an extension, one more year on his contract. Like, <laughs> why the hell are you giving him an extension from twenty twenty four to twenty twenty five right now? It makes no sense. Like thinking, oh, that's gonna help him like recruit better. Like, dude, he's already there till twenty twenty four. Yep. whatever I, that's besides the point whoever's the admin is there is just awful and then the morning of signing day it's like dillingham their oc is like yeah i'm leaving <laughs> and it's like oh wait you left oregon yeah. yeah and it's like the morning of like you couldn't just wait like six hours for these kids to sign and uh he left and all of a sudden we started hearing rumors they're like um hunter's not going to florida state anymore and we're like Where's he going to go? Like, he's like the number one prospect in the country. It's like, I guess he can go anywhere technically, but it's like, mm-hmm. what the hell? And someone goes Jackson State. I'm like, huh, yeah, right. All right. Good one, buddy. And we just get, and I got like our little group chat we have for like our rivals guys. They're like, no, it's dead serious. I was like, what the? F-? And I'm looking and like Barstool posted something and they're like, it was a Deion Sanders interview like the day before. And he was like, we're going to shock the world tomorrow. We're going to shock the world. And I'm like, oh my God, like this is, this is fucking happening. Prime time's going to do it. And yeah, the times when people say we're going to shock the world, it's like such a letdown. But this truly, well, I like, thought he was going to land like another four star. Like he's he's landed a couple of like pretty solid ones. I know he flipped one from Penn State last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, did Juan Warren, uh, JUCO four star. So I mean, that's a he, he's recruiting pretty pretty damn well for uh, Jackson State. It's just like based on everything I've heard. Um, I know the former Tennessee State coach or current Tennessee State coach. I forget who Eddie George is the coach down there. Uh, Hugh yep. Jackson just got a job down there somewhere. Like the HBCUs are actually like looking pretty good. It's just apparently the funding's not there. I think it might have actually been Dion that said something. Yeah, I know he said in an interview, people were like basically saying that Hunter got like a huge NIL deal to sign there. And Dion's like, we don't got no money. What are you talking about? We got no money. And then, of like, course, why, would like, somebody, why would I pay somebody to like make more than I do? Yeah, well, of course, like they're and then Barstool kind of hypes it up a little bit because the rumor was was like Penn Gaming and Barstool did it, and like Portnoy was like quote tweeting stuff saying like I'm not going to say any word, no comment. Like it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, that'd be a great yeah. move. For it's it's an interesting move, and like it's the legality behind it is even more intriguing because Penn Gaming owns Barstool. Barstool um, has a contract with Deion Sanders to be on the show. But then they're going to pay a recruit to go play for Deion Sanders at uh, Jackson State. It's like, I, I guess it's legal, technically. I don't know. The more and more I look into this whole NIL thing, it's it's basically like everything that's been happening, the shady stuff that's been happening behind the scenes for years, and it's like public now. It's like, yeah, we don't care anymore. Yeah. I, I And just like everything else with the NCAA, it's like they make a decision and have no – like rules or no like foresight behind any of the decisions it's, they were pressured into doing this and they just allowed it to happen so it's kind of the wild west right now i'd imagine that there yeah, will be okay. some kind of rules that are formed around nil moving forward i just it's kind of like how do you put the genie back in the bottle when you just allow this like free-flowing money you were kind of screwed at this point I, I don't know what the ncaa is going to do even if they tried it like turn it around and be like oh you can't do this anymore i think it's that it's getting to the point where schools are just going to be like hey we're seceding from the ncaa like we're out like fuck you we don't need you anymore yep i i I mean i definitely could see that happening especially if if the proposed new like cfp structure doesn't work out i could just see like all that hasn't like 
been done already is ridiculous in my opinion, but yep. that's another issue for another day. Yeah, let's let's talk about the class that signed yesterday. Uh, we had an 18 person class from the class of 2022 in terms of high schoolers. I'm just gonna go alphabetically through these names. You could add, you know, a few comments on each guy, what we can expect. Yeah, go for it. Uh, let's start with Armarian Brown. He's a wide receiver from Florida. He's a four-star kid. Let's talk about him. So he's intriguing because um, before anyone starts ripping me again, by the way, um, <laughs> he uh, he did. He was scheduled to visit this weekend, this past weekend. He was 100% ready to go. I'm told there was a plane ticket bought for him and everything. So I I don't I don't want to hear it that Richie doesn't know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I reported what I knew. So uh, regardless, um, if he's intriguing because he didn't play his senior year. And I was told it wasn't due to injury. It was due to personal reasons, whatever the hell that means. I don't know. Um, he's a very, very nice kid. Very, very well spoken for a Florida kid too. I know a lot of Florida kids that uh, have ended up at Rutgers in the past are kind of just like kind of mean, kind of don't answer the phone, you know, like those type of kids. But uh, yeah. no, he's, he's, one of the best when it comes to talking to him and interviews and stuff like that. He's got a chance to play right away just because Bo Melton's not here anymore. Shameen Jones is probably your only receiver. Krupshank is still going to be returning from ACL injury. Don't know how much he's going to play. You're going to either depend on Brandon Sanders or you're going to depend on the Marion Brown. And it's, it's kind of scary to look at that wide receiver room right now and project them to do much of anything in 2022. But I do think he'll play a role. He's is very, he very skinny. Um, he's going to try to get on campus in January. It's not official yet. I don't know if you heard. Oh, well, you didn't hear, obviously. Um, Greg said yesterday in our, uh, we posted a transcript. He said anywhere from eight to 14 kids will be early enrolling. That's awesome. And they don't know 100% yet. They're still trying to figure out logistics in terms of transcripts, which kids can technically enroll, what they have to do testing-wise, grade-wise, et cetera, et cetera, credits-wise. Um, if you can get 14, you do it. I don't think there's a question oh, yeah. at all. And uh, it was kind of cool. Like Greg talked about it a little bit more in depth. He's like, my senior year, like the more and more I think about it, I wanted to spend that spring and like, we had so much fun, like when I was a senior, but now like looking at kids, I think the quote was like looking at kids that have potential NFL futures. I can understand why they want to get here as soon as possible. It makes sense. So. And also he, he says it like that, but at the same time, I'm sure the staff is like, like everyone on campus. on campus as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, 14 of 18 would be wild. I'm projecting more like 10, maybe. I know we confirmed like five already. I know Joe DeCrashi, or the five are Moses Walker, Amonqua, Kenny Fletcher. Ah, do the other two. Post the other two. Rashad Rochelle. And there's, there's one more I can't think off the top of my head. Um, hold up real quick. Uh, Taj White. And then Joe DeCrashi is 50-50 last I talked to him. Um, he's probably one of those kids that's trying to find out logistically. Um, I think you get him in as soon as possible so doctors and like medical staff can kind of look at his knee and be like, all right, if you start doing this more or this training or this, this method more, like you're going to rebuild more strength there or whatever, like just a little stuff in terms yep. of injury-wise or rehab. Other than that, um, Gavin Wimsett's already on campus. Um, you're going to get one wide receiver, ideally you get both. Uh, offensive linemen, I think you're gonna to try to get everybody in as soon as possible. That's not a question whatsoever. Yeah, try and assess if any of those guys have potential to play this year. Yeah, probably, I'm gonna to lean towards no. Yeah. Um, I think that line's kind of set in stone at this point, minus the transfer, who they're probably gonna get. Um, left to right, I hate to dive like deep into this, but left to right real quick, transfer O'Neal. Zelensky is Sutton, if healthy. If not, probably Ireland Brown, who I think actually played better than Rainey, but either or you could probably mix match that one. Um, and then uh, Holland Pierce isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It is intriguing though to see this line group. They're all like 6'5", 6'6", 6'7". And it's clear as day, like they want to get bigger up front. And it's, it's a huge need and that's where it's going to start. The minute they get these guys starting to play, not 2022, probably 2023, 24 maybe even, I think that's when you'll see the biggest impact of this recruiting class, probably 2024, I'd say. For sure. Uh, the next guy on this list here is Anthony Johnson. He's a linebacker out of Philly. Kind of touched on him, but tell me a little bit about him. 
So he's kind of an intriguing one. Actually, the co- cool story behind him, um, he was down in Texas for this uh, Takis All-American oh, that. day or something. And uh, Alex was down there because he actually helped um, coordinate the deal, apparently, with his, uh, with his day job. So that's why he was down there. Got to talk to Anthony Johnson. We have a whole video on the site about him. Uh, I think he was the first commit in the class, if I recall correctly. If he wasn't the first, I know he was the first four star, and that kind of came out of left. That's what it was. We were just like, I think it, he might have been the first commit, actually. No, the yeah. first commit was so Kobe committed before him. Okay. But, and so did uh, Nelson Monegro. I think Nelson, no, Taj White was the first commit. Yes. No. Wait, yeah. Rashad Rochelle? Yes. You're right. Rashad Rochelle committed. Wow. So, so he was actually the sixth commit, but he, yeah, you were right. He was the first four star. Um, he's intriguing because number one, like he had a lot of offers and a lot of them were based on him playing linebacker at the next level, packed on some pounds. I think uh, Rutgers list him at 245. So it's like, he probably is going to end up on the defensive line. And you hate to say that, but they're going to try their best to kind of keep him at the linebacker position. I think with, um, with their strength and conditioning staff over there, they should be able to kind of maintain his weight at the right number. But he's quick, he's fast, and he, and he hits with as much power as just about anyone on the team currently. He just, if you watch his highlight tape, he is killing some wide receivers and running backs over the middle. Like, it, it's, he's a ferocious linebacker, and that's kind of what Rutgers needs. I guess you got to replace your guys. You're losing four of them this uh, offseason, whether it be uh, graduation or NFL draft. Um, yeah, he, he's a very good player, good get. Um, kind of stolen from under a couple of like, schools' noses because I do think a lot backed off when uh, they found out his weight and all that. But I do think he could be a very good player for Rutgers. Uh, so next up, we have Dante Chin. He's an offensive lineman, a recent <coughs> commit from Florida. Uh, we kind of touched on him in, um, I think, the last episode or two episodes ago, but just a yeah. brief overview on him. Um, I talked to Greg about him, actually. I was I asked him a question about it yesterday. You'll read it in that transcript if you want to go check it out. He basically said um, kind of like guys stop recruiting people when they're seniors if they're not getting any type of thing. So now the intriguing part is, is Chin didn't play his sophomore, junior, freshman. Like, he never played football before. And all of a sudden, he got on the field this year. Um, Greg's pretty familiar with um, their head coach, uh, Rocco Casulo, I think it is. Um, he actually coached against Greg coached against his father back in the day, which is a little interesting. I think he said he coached against him or played with him. I forget what it was. Um, trying to look at it. Yeah, he coached against them back in the day at Cypress Bay, who where he's now the head coach. Uh, his son's the head coach. He's intriguing. He's kind of um, he's pretty like pretty damn good, pretty quick on his feet. Um, he's 6'5, 290, 295 or area. Um, he plays till the whistle blows easily. Like you can see that on the first three plays. Yeah, it's all guys all the way out of bounds. Like. Pancakes, 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 pancakes. Yeah, like he's he's not a bad player. Up uh, technique wise, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. He needs to fix a lot of that. He's almost like does the same thing here. Price does another signing in this class, where he almost stands up and then pushes. Like it's just you have the pad level already, so why bother like doing stuff like that? But it's all teachable stuff and. It's a, it's a really good late get just because no one else saw him. No one else kind of knew about him. Um, hoops player, um, never played football. So it's, it's, a, it's a risk, of course, as it's always with, with offensive linemen. I think on average schools hit on about recruiting class-wise. Uh, I think the number yesterday I heard was schools hit about 30% of them. So, I mean, it's, it's not a bad risk. It's, it's a take, but it's interesting. We'll see what happens with him. Uh, next up, we got Demetrius, a.k.a. DJ Allen from Indiana. He's a DN. <clears throat> Big guy. Um, yeah, I think DJ Allen might be the – it's, it's a tough thing to say that, actually. But <laughs> he, he might be the best defensive lineman in this class when all is said and done. Wow. And I love crazy. Kenny Fletcher. Like, I am super, super high on Kenny Fletcher. I think he's the best prospect in the state. But Demetrius Allen's just super lengthy. He doesn't play at a huge school. Like, it's a middle, like, tier school at Leo, Indiana. Um, playing in Indiana is definitely not going to help you either, but he's super lengthy. He's like six, 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 seven. Yeah. So just the, the length on him is ridiculous. His wingspan's insane. He's, I, I love this kid. Like I know Alex was talking to me about him yesterday and Alex thinks he might be like, he could probably push for a four star in our, in his opinion. 
I think he should be higher than what he is. I think he should be at least top 10 in Indiana. Um, but like, again, like I said, playing at Leo is not going to win you over much and playing in Indiana in general is not going to win people over, but watch this tape, give it a look, give it a read our breakdown on him. I, I think this kid's going to be super good at Rutgers. He's got the frame to put on at least another 50, 60 pounds. Yeah. So. yeah I think he's like six, seven, like 210, 220, something like that. Like he's going to, he's not going to play a ton right away, but he'll pack on weight and be a good edge guy. Next up, we got uh, Amir Stinnett from, he's an offensive lineman from Philly. He's another big boy. Uh, what have you heard about him? And has he, has he lost any weight this year? I know that was a concern. When we I started. think, um, I think Rutgers actually listed him. At, like, I don't know what, exactly. let me go double check on what they listed him at, but um, he's, he's a good one. He's a good prospect because he's, he's a little bit of a project, but you're also getting into that MLTAP charter school, which, um, produces nonstop recruits yeah, like they have a lot of good recruits in there every program. every single year they're producing i think they had i want to say upwards of five plus this past season um signed with power five schools he's he, the coach down there dev johnson does a really really good job um that's a school that didn't come to Rutgers at all during the chris ash era like any type of visits whatsoever and then all of a sudden under shiano they're up here at the seven on seven camp they're up here for a visit for a team visit or whatever and then all of a sudden they, they land a kid there. So it's a good start to get back in there. He's still listed at 6'5", 380 from Rutgers. So that basically means when I, when I say per Rutgers, this is like the numbers they put out. This is what they listed and weighed and measured at, at uh, during their, their official visits. So that's, that's pretty yeah, recent. These are like legitimate numbers. They're not just. Yeah. Like these are legitimate numbers. Now, mind you, they could change when they get back to campus because they, they weigh them, they do the height thing again. And obviously their weight's going to fluctuate now between now, January, now and June, whatever. So, um, yeah, so 6'5", 280, um, <laughs> or 380, it's, it's still up there. But if you look at Holland Pierce, what they did with him, it's, it's not insane to say that he could be dropping 20, 30 pounds in the first season. Yeah, that would be huge because it seems like he's a great player. It's just he was one of those <clears throat> players that had questions about his, his frame, kind of, we've yeah. kind of had that show up a few times on the guys we've talked about already i can't believe how fucking quick he is for 380 like it's he's quick as shit they're pulling him and stuff and i'm like holy shit this kid's running like yeah he's he's a natural athlete he's just a big guy and if he yeah. can get down to probably 330 that'd be huge for that's him. and that's that played a it plays a factor in the rankings too when you see a guy that big it's kind of like all right most programs aren't going to touch because they're just gonna be like i'm not wasting two years i'm just trying to fix the kid's weight like that's just we have other needs so it's a project, yes, but if you can fix it like you did with Pierce, I mean, there's no reason why he can't be a starter here. For sure. Uh, next up is another offensive lineman, Jacob Allen from the Hunt School, the <laughs> one's prospect in the state. Tell us a little bit about him and uh, when you really can see him making an impact. That's that's a tough question there. Um, Jacob's an intriguing one. He's a very good – He's a, he's got he has so much potential. The potential is limitless for him. He has like three-year starter potential. It's just putting it all together. Um, I know watch, like he's going to be in the all American bowl from what I know. I don't know if he'll play in it. I know a lot of kids that are going down there, um, are kind of just going down just to like hang out and get like the, all the et cetera stuff, like the prizes and all that type of stuff. But, uh, he, he's a very powerful blocker. He finishes his blocks on, on his, um, film very moves very well laterally. Um, he, he's super athletic and that that's kind of been like a thing in this class. Like there's a lot of athleticism. Whether the guys are 6'5", 380, they're super athletic. Now you got Jacob Young, who or Jacob Young, Jesus. Jacob, Jacob Allen, uh, who's 6'6", 295, and he, another super athletic tackle. Um, this offensive line class in general, they're all massive, but they can all move. And I think that's something that it's clear as day that's something this Rutgers offense wants to do. They want guys that can run. They want guys that can move and block downfield. And, uh, yeah, I mean, very, very good get. And first time they got a number one prospect in New Jersey since 2012 when Darius Hamilton. Yeah, you can say Singleton, but that doesn't count. Yeah, and he was one of the two guys in the class that seemed like uh, Penn State really wanted at the time. So huge recruiting win there to not only land him, but also to, to keep him in the class. Uh, next is another offensive lineman, Joe DeCroche. Uh, he's an offensive lineman from – I know you went to uh, – he started off at Bosco and now he's at uh, Demarest. So tell us a little bit, a little bit about him. Yeah. It's a shame that he actually got, ended up getting injured. Uh, I think there's ACL and something else in his knee he tore. 
Um, he's, he's an insane guy in the weight room. Um, he was actually a very good player at Bosco. The reason he went home is just because he wanted to play a senior year with his friends, which, which I get totally understand. Um, if you watch his like weight room videos, this man had like a full on knee immobilizer. And all years I know that is because I've torn everything in my knees, but he, uh, <laughs> doing like, he was doing like bench press, like the day after his knee got hurt. Yeah, like the day after surgery. And they say you're supposed to like kind of try to bend it a little bit after surgery, like day one, and they want you kind of moving, just trying to get that muscle back or memory. And, uh, this guy's like benching and I'm sitting here. I'm like, damn, like when I tore mine, I'm sitting here, like playing Xbox in the background with my <laughs> knee, like rested up. And I'm like sitting there like, mom, I need, I need the meds. I need the meds. Wait, it, hurts. <laughs> it hurts. Like I need, I need those, pe- I need the pill. <laughs> and all of a sudden this man's out here bench pressing i'm like holy shit like he's and he, he actually tweeted uh yesterday i don't know if you saw he's like the minute i get the records i'm breaking the the weight room records i'm like uh, i mean I, I believe it the dude's scary big like and that's something we need we need some strength in the, on the, along the yeah i mean even if he didn't get if he didn't get hurt i think he probably could have played his way into like i know he's 21 for us right now he, he, it's, put it like this the kid moved up in our new state rankings after getting injured so I think he could have been like top 13, top 14 around there is all said and done. But uh, I love the kid. I think he's going to be so good. Next up, Kenny Fletcher, at the end from Delran. You've already kind of, uh, you know, let your love for him be known. But tell us a little bit about R- Rutgers is getting in Fletcher. Uh, yeah, he's he's going to be so good. I'm, I'm telling you, he's my favorite prospect in the state this year. Um, it, it was tough, too, because Igman Oson's pretty damn good, too, at DB. But Kenny Fletcher is just so dynamic. Um, he he does it all for this program. Um, he punts, he kicks, he plays defense, plays offense. It's like, it's insane. But he's, he's got such a quick first step on that edge. Um, he's super instinctive when it comes to getting to that quarterback. Um, just constant pressure guy. He's, he's going to be such a good edge rusher for Rutgers. He just, he's going to need some time to add muscle. I think he's like 2 15 per us um what he's actually listed at per Rutgers is not 215 um 6 4 2 15 so I mean he's going to be a very good prospect just needs to add some pounds to him add some strength once he f- adds that strength I'm a little concerned that he might lose a little bit of speed but um if he doesn't if he can keep that maintain that speed while adding muscle it's sky's the limit for him yeah I'm excited for for uh, Fletcher yeah M- mind you he also chose Rutgers over like Michigan, Penn State, Duke, Boston College, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but he committed early too, so. Yeah, he's got a huge get, and it goes back to the Fran Brown talk. He's a big reason why uh, Kenny Fletcher's here. Yep, thank God we, we held on to, to Fran for at least one more year. Um, next off, next prospect is another offensive lineman, uh, sensing a theme here. Kobe Asamoa, he's from Pickering, Ohio. Uh, he's another huge dude, like one of the thickest – high school lineman prospects are, I've ever seen. Yeah, he's a little bit smaller. I know we had him listed at 6'4". I think he's probably more like 6'3"-ish, 6'2"-ish maybe. No, I'd say about probably 6'3"-ish. Six, six, um, super funny dude to talk to. Like, he, he's yeah. hilarious. Um, I know, like, what, just talking to him, like, at one of the camps this summer, like, just he was bagging on, like, the, I'm, I'm Kenny Fletcher, actually. He's like, yeah, he's not that good. Like, and meanwhile, Kenny's standing like, right next to him. <laughs> like, yeah, he's average, like, the, at best. I know I shut him down. I shut Anthony Johnson down. I shut, uh, who was the other one? I shut Allen over there down. And they're funny dudes, but uh, he's going to play center for Rutgers. I wouldn't be shocked. I think he's the most college ready uh, offensive lineman in this group. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if he pushed Solinskis a little bit, although they are very high on Solinskis at center. But um, really good dude. I think um, Rutgers actually lists him weighing in at 325, so he's a little bit on the bulkier side. But uh, he's probably going to drop down. To, his playing weight's probably like 300, 310. Um, very good prospect. Very mean highlight tape if you watch him. Um, plays at one of the best schools in the Midwest in Pickerton Central, who produced, I think, four or five power five guys um yeah just a consistent blocker too like very very good player next up michael higgins he's a tight end from blair uh he previously was at bosco he followed the same route as victor kanopka yeah the Rutgers. uh tell us what we're getting in him um he's a little bit different because he's not like kanopka kanopka was more bulkier more of like probably a future offensive lineman if i had to guess when i saw his tape um but then you watch Higgins, it's like Higgins is more of like that typical basketball player you see on a football field. 
someone that could jump up and has the insane catch radius and can kind of catch just about anything thrown his way. You'll see a quarterback overthrow him, and all of a sudden you're like, holy shit, he just hauled it in. He's, <laughs> he's one of those type of guys. Like, um, And you see it on his, on his basketball tape too. But uh, really strong hands, really good pass catcher. Um, he's going to have to work on blocking. That's going to be something he has to learn. Uh, I don't know if he really understands the game of football that much as well. It's Again, it's, it's teachable stuff. Um, but in terms of athleticism, he's super athletic. Um, watch his tape. I mean, they kind of used him in like, a, like whenever they saw a smaller defender, it's kind of like, all right, put him on the outside and just let him go up. And it, it worked out for him. So now we're kind of, um, it's, a, it's a decent get a tight end. They're going to need to probably, I think they should add a transfer. I don't know if they're going to, but um, you're going to lose Haskins. Alimo's still there. I don't know. Johnny Lankin, though, he's been pretty good. So, um, yeah, I mean, Higgins, solid prospect. It's not not a crazy get. Nothing, wait, another weight offer guy, but a uh, good addition to the tight end room. Yeah, it seems like we might be looking into the transfer portal for potentially, like, potential walk-on uh, tight ends. Like, that guy's still on a CB Knights edition as a yeah, walk Yeah, I know um, – after bowl season, there's going to be so many people that enter. They just want to play yeah. that last game, and then that's it pretty much. You'll see another 100 or so people, probably more than 100, probably see like another 200 enter the portal. And then after spring, you'll see another 200 enter the portal. Yeah. So we'll see. Plenty of time for Rutgers to add guys. For sure. Next up is probably my favorite prospect in the class, Moses Walker, the linebacker from E-Hall in New York. Mm -hmm. That's good. I mean, just put on the tape and speak for itself. He's – he played in Jersey. He's probably a top three, top four prospect. Um, very good kid. Erasmus Hall. Uh, Rutgers fans love him for his commitment, the way he spurned Penn State. It started drawing like a little outline. In the One of the best troll video, video commitments of all time. Yeah, I know um, Penn State. Put it like this. Penn, they con they, A lot of people consider Penn State linebacker you. At the end of the day, I know Rutgers fans don't like to hear that, but they pushed him and pushed him and pushed him throughout his entire recruitment, even after he did that little video. That tells you that he's like pretty uh, pretty well wanted. Um, very good kid, very talented. It, we were just talking about it. Wouldn't surprise me if he played year one, especially after the team lost four linebackers. Um, he's going to be phenomenal, and it's just going to continue that e-haul the Rutgers pipeline, and that's it's a huge thing because they're consistently producing a top kid in New York. So very good. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And I mean, Penn State's probably at it's like it, it's able to recruit linebackers right now. Is as good as anybody, given what Michael Parsons is doing in the NFL. I, yeah, you know? that's insane. But I mean, he's just like an all-time freak. But yeah, no, I wish uh, wish the Giants didn't fuck that one up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. They didn't take a quarterback. They uh, they didn't take they didn't take Parsons. They let everybody know that they wanted Devonta Smith. That's... Yeah, and then we're gonna replace our GM. We're gonna give him the same head coach, and then we're gonna give him the injury-prone quarterback. So do with it what you might. Well, at least you're going to have two roughly top 10 picks in the draft. That, that helps. Uh, or hear me out and trade for Russell Wilson and just say, fuck it. I mean, honestly, I think that's what you guys should do. But coming from an Eagles fan, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Russell Wilson twice a year. Uh, but next up in the class, we have Nelson Manegro. He's a Union City kid. He's an offensive lineman. He's one of two. Uh, commits we have from two different classes from that offensive line. What are we getting in Monegro? Um, well, number one, you're getting a Union City kid. First time since 2007 that Rutgers has done that. Hell, since Manny Abreu? Yeah, that's it. Wow. No one else. Um, <laughs> it's kind of sad to say. So, I mean, it, it's good to build these connections, number one. Number two, he's got a ton of potential. A tall, lengthy kid. Doesn't really know the game that well yet, but he's starting to learn it more and more. He's like uh, a couple of the Union City guys are kind of raw on offensive line, but they just find these freaky athletes. And it's just like, if you could just kind of teach him the game a little bit, this kid could be good. Um, I think he's a multi-year starter at tackle. I don't know left or right. I think that's still kind of up in the air. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to touch on, I want to kind of get through all this whole thing, but very good, tall, lengthy, good kid. Um, very good get for Rutgers. Uh, next up, we have Kyrie Price. He's from DePaul Catholic, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. Oops, sorry. Syracuse flip, um, pretty big. Rutgers looked at him early on in summer, kind of like, kind of backed off a little bit. He wanted Rutgers really bad. 
ended up going to Syracuse um, after an insane senior tape uh, where he dominated the Big North. Rutgers ended up picking him back up. Uh, I said it before, he's got to fix a couple things. Um, a lot of people are clamoring for him to get back to that four-star status. I don't see it still. Uh, he's, he's a very good prospect, had a very good senior year, but it's all about projections too. And um, he's kind of, he wasn't projected as an interior guy until recently when he packed on a lot of pounds. Uh, he's massive. He's going to be an interesting one. They're going to kind of try to mold his body into that interior defensive tackle they're looking for. Um, I don't know when he'll play, maybe probably year three, I would think, or year two, to, just because you got guys like Hamilton, who's going to be a mainstay there. Um, Mayan Hanna, too. I forget how many more years he has left, but I know he has a couple. Uh, there, there's a ton of other dudes they're bringing in, too, or they brought in. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he good prospect. You get back into Big North again, another school that Rutgers has not landed a kid at in quite some time. Um, they're constantly producing talent, just couldn't get Big North kids. So it, it, it's a big win for Rutgers. For sure. Uh, another, the next commit is Rashad Rochelle. He's from Illinois. He's a quarterback, mm -hmm. but he's going to be coming in as a wide receiver. I, yeah. uh, I don't understand how the hell you recruit a kid that's never ran. Like he doesn't even do the camps at wide receiver or DB. Like it's, he runs them as a quarterback and it's like, and that, that kind of played a little bit of a, a role in his rankings because it's, it's impossible to rank the kid. Like how are you supposed to rank him as an athlete, but all he does is play quarterback constantly. Um, I know talking to our, uh, the guy's name is Edgy Tim. He's in charge of Illinois high school recruiting for us. Yep. He's very, very high on the kid. He thinks he's a power five quarterback. I, I personally don't see that. I think he's a G five quarterback, which is still pretty damn good. Kind yep. of reminds me, um, who was the quarterback I was thinking of? He's a, he, he's just small. He's a dual threat quarterback. Um, I don't know how well he's going to be as a transition to a receiver, but I know Tyquan Underwood is super high on him. He's been speaking very highly of him all summer long. Um, I mean, he was their first commit in the class. Like it, it was a big one for them and they were very excited about him. I, I don't really know what else to say other than that. Like it's, it's so tough to judge him as a quarterback. And I wanted to ask Greg about it yesterday. Someone ended up doing it. And that, I think it was Cratch and Cratch actually ended up asking him if he was going to play quarterback. <laughs> it, it's like a baiting question, but. He, he's not going to be a quarterback at Rutgers. So whoever's thinking that on the boards, get it out of your head. <laughs> yep. So the next commit is uh, our last four-star of the class, Samuel Brown. He's a line or a running back from mm -hmm. LaSalle Prep, I believe, in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. What, what do you know about him? Um, he's a, another school that's producing. That's kind of been the theme of this class, schools that are producing a ton of, ton of talent year in and year, out, year, in and year out. Jeez, can't talk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> LaSalle College High School uh, has a four-star run of Rutgers, a four-star run of Penn State. I think they have a couple others going to G5s. He's interesting because Greg called him very fast yesterday. I don't see that on his tape. I see more of a bulky power back, guy that's kind of patient, waits for his blocks to develop, uh, very tough runner, not afraid to go in between the tackles, uh, pretty good vision too. And that, that kind of leans back towards that uh, patient, waiting, patient guy too. Uh, pretty good pass catcher as well. Uh, I don't think he's the fastest in the world, but I think he's a pretty consistent downhill runner. Um, very tough, very tough back. Um, I don't know. He's, he's going to be a, a pretty good player. Uh, the only downside to him is he's not going to be here till summer. So that's going to hurt his development a little bit, but I don't, I didn't expect him to play year one anyway. Their power back next year is hundred percent Jameer Wright Collins. Uh, he would have played a lot more this year if it wasn't for his hamstring and stuff like that. But he, he's going to be their power back next year and they're super high on him. So I think he kind of, Sam Brown's a guy that's just going to kind of step up after Wright Collins uh, moves on. Awesome. Uh, next commit was the first commit of the class or second commit of the class. Sorry, Taj White. He's an offensive lineman from uh... Hudson Catholic. Hudson Catholic. <laughs> yeah, he, he's uh he was one of the first commits. I think he was two or three. I forget exactly. Massive offensive tackle. Um, he, he last time I talked to him, he was six, 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 seven, and he's still growing, his doctor said, which is yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna do if he grows to like six, eight, six, nine. It's just like <laughs> you're gonna have him and Holland Pierce on the edge, like holy shit. Like, yeah. Um, very good kid. Um, he's he's got a, he's pretty light on his feet for his size. I think he's listed for us at 330. I think Rutgers listed him at 310. So he did lose some weight. Okay. 310 is probably around his playing weight. Um, 
he's he's intriguing because he's another guy like Jacob Allen that's pretty quick laterally laterally geez I can't talk today at all um <laughs> he's, he's a very good uh run blocker too um I, I'm intrigued to see how good he's going to be he has a lot of potential almost a top 10 kid in state we had him at 11 I probably would have argued number 10 but that's besides the point um he played at Hudson Catholic so it's it's a little hard to judge based on the competition but I wish he would have went to one of the big North schools that was pushing for him in the off season, but what are you going to do at the end of the day? Um, really good player. Um, not afraid to get to that second level. And when he does get to that second level, he's pretty fluid in movements. So I think, I think he's going to be a good one for Rutgers. I don't know how or when like offensive lineman, like I said, it's, it's hit or miss. Gotcha. Uh, second to last commit of the class was a guy who committed during his senior season. Uh, he had arguably the best, year of anybody in New Jersey this year. It was Thomas Amonqua from Hillsborough. Uh, he could arguably play a lot of different positions for Rutgers. Where is he being brought in at, though? Um, well, that's the thing. We talked to Greg about it yesterday. They list him as an athlete, and that's that was probably the first question we had for Greg, and it was kind of like, all right, come on. Like, you, you list him as an athlete, but you kind of know. Like, stop lying. Um, originally, from when I was told, he was going to go to defense. He was going to play corner or safety. They weren't sure there that yet either. So it's kind of like he's just super athletic, um, really good ball recognition skills on his tape. But then you look at his numbers on offense and it's like, oh, shit, like, what do we do here? Um, I know um, Greg said that Taekwon and Fran are kind of fighting back and forth. So I'm like, who's going to get him? I personally think he ends up on defense. He's a really good zone coverage guy. He's great ball hawk skills. Um, very another guy that's very instinctive on the football um, but at the end of the day I I don't I don't really know like those offensive numbers and the senior tape kind of scream wide receiver to me and it's clear as day they need help there too so it's like I, I really don't know where he ends up yeah uh, very good athlete very good get I know Greg was saying that they were talking to him throughout the whole process he actually visited one of the one of the camps in June and I remember talking to him, and he's like, yeah, like, they don't have a scholarship open right now. And I'm like, damn, that kind of sucks, because he's, like, a decent prospect. He looked good in camps. I saw him at uh, the Zone 6 camp, and he stood out to us. He was in one of those notebooks that we write up. And then all of a sudden, senior year came, he put up numbers. I'm like, holy shit, this kid's really good. Yeah. And boom, Rutgers offered, and there you go. Yeah, he's kind of crazy. I'm looking at his stats now from senior year. Like he didn't really, he didn't really put up much stats his first two years as like a varsity starter. But this year, he had 1,100 rushing yards and 15 touchdowns, 850 receiving yards on 36 receptions and 12 touchdowns. Like yeah. basically, almost every time he touched the ball, he scored. It's pretty wild. Yeah, and he led him to a state championship. So, and I mean, of, uh, the whole Rutgers staff at Rutgers Stadium, and he had yeah. a highlight that ended up on Sports Center, the the one where he mossed the guy down the sideline. Yeah, he was um he was on that. The whole staff was there, but you know who wasn't there? I didn't see Rob Smith there. Rob Smith, uh, the conspiracy is still alive. Uh, uh, yeah. The last uh, commit of the class, uh, Zylan Williams from Dematha in Maryland. Uh, this is a kid who was a late addition. What are we getting here? <laughs> So he only played three games his junior year because of that COVID season and every everything was weird. I, know Mar I don't even think Maryland actually played like a f season at all for most schools. Most schools just ended up canceling. I think if he had a junior year, he would have gotten a lot more attention. But uh, William Williams is a good player. He's another guy that's super instinctive. He's very good in zone at like following the receiver towards a certain area, which is basically zone <laughs> at that <laughs> point. Um very solid tackler. Um, we actually saw him in the Rivals camp back in, what was it, May, June? I think May, April, whatever it was. Uh, he was one of the better DBs among the group. Um, there was a couple out there that were bigger names, like three, four-star guys, and he, he ended up showing out and being one of the best of the, of the entire day um, against some very talented receivers, too. Like So overall, he's, he's a solid kid, good technique. Uh, I hate to keep using the word, word instinctive, but like he kind of runs off instinct too. And it's, it's a very good player. And I actually thought he was one of the better DBs in the, that Rutgers has offered in this class. Uh, but the lack of junior tape really, really hurt his recruitment. Yeah, and I mean, this is kind of where you really earn your, your stripes as a recruiter, like finding those guys who... Yeah like Rochelle or like an Amonqua or like Zion Williams, who, you know, you might not have like a clear one-to-one -one translation or they might've broken out late or they might've just had extenuating circumstances that don't really affect the level of prospect they are. It's just, they haven't necessarily been featured in 
you know, their junior year, like you ideally would be if you're a high level recruit. Yeah. I mean, um, it's overall, it's a pretty good class. It's uh number two, number two, technically number three, I guess you want to call it. I'm going to call it two just because that first class, I don't count for Greg at all. Yeah. What did he have like three weeks to assemble it? Three weeks, but he flipped the Virginia tech kid, flipped the Purdue kid, flipped the um, temple kid. Like it's. And if you look at who those three guys were, you we're just need green pal, who's yeah. a starter. You named Max Williams, who's one of the best, or Max Melton, who's one of the best players on defense. Yeah. And you named Robert Longerbeam, who had like some really good flash moments this year. So three really impact players. It's kind of wild. It's kind of like if you're Greg, you know what? Maybe just go off instinct and just stay <laughs> through it. Like just start flipping random kids last minute. He's done. He's done really well for himself with those last, like back in the day when he used to get those signing day surprises. I think he got like the McCordys as a yeah. signing day surprise. Ron Gerald as a signing day surprise. Like. Yeah, it, it's so tough, too. Like, I know everyone wants the surprises, but it's, like, with social media being the way it is, it's so well-known where people are going. Yep. And I guess technically they still have a chance. They're going to still push for uh, Davis and Igmanosin as long as possible. It's going to decide at that uh, All-American game in a couple of weeks. Uh, Ryan Patty's going to be down there for us. I think um, two Rutgers guys, one Rutgers guy, I forget. I think it's just one in Jacob Allen. Maybe two, but they they also have like that that event beforehand, the day before of all the uh, the 2023s, 24 kids. So there's going to be a ton of Rutgers coverage on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the class isn't done yet by any means. There's still transfer portal. There's still Igmanos in. There's that that's kind of it actually. <laughs> <laughs> the more I think about it, they're, they're going to try to get an offensive lineman. It's clear as day they're pushing for a linebacker between Reader, who just de- are committed to Iowa State, and then they got Canton Arku, who I think ends up at Rutgers. So. Not a ton of scholarships, but um, after landing a linebacker, I think it's an all-out push for an offensive lineman, and that's that's pretty much it there. I mean, as things don't really look, like, great for Igbenusen, Igbenusen right now, like, wow. it has to be wow. seen as a good sign that he pushed it off a little bit. Even if it's purely to make his announcement, the more time he has to think about it, his brother's on break right now. He's, he's in the same house as Desmond, so you yeah. got to think that's helping. I know. I just don't think, like, that – does anything i know everyone kind of like overrates it and it's like yeah like they're in the same household i'm like yeah, they're still brothers you act like they're not talking 24 7 like that's true that's true like just because they're living together it's just more or less like whatever i know lane kiffin's won over that family very well um and it's not just him partridge has done it marquise watson's played a big role um they're, they're gonna end up landing the top kid in new jersey pat two years in a row in that's Nick awesome. and i i think they have a hell of a shot at uh Sadir mitchell and it's not even just them. It's more the the connection to Taiwan alone. Um, I know Sadir looks up to him like an older brother, and it's it's going to be so tough to keep him away from Ole Miss. Ole Miss is going to be good. Like, really good. <laughs> it sucks, but at least you don't have to play him. That's true. Well, unless we go to a bowl game and happen to play him. But, yeah, basically no chance there. Yeah, it's a tough one. But, oh, well, what are you going to do? Well, that's been the the signing day recap pod, guys. Uh, it's been uh, it's, I'm glad you guys all stuck with us. It's been a lot, um, but I feel like we get we got some good information out of this from what we're getting in this class and what we might be able to look forward to with the transfer portal. Richie, you got anything else before we sign off here? Uh, I'm gonna go take like a three month long nap and wake <laughs> up when spring ball starts. So uh, don't bother me. All right. Um, no, you know what's gonna happen. You know the 2023 class is starting day one today. Um, they have one commit already in Jasir Peterson, top 10 Jersey kid. They're probably going to get another top 10 kid in Eric King. And that's probably the most, that's probably the only name I'd watch out for right now. Um, they're, they're pushing so many dudes. Santana Fleming, four star, Bryson Rogers, four star. They're, they're aiming high in this one. This one yeah. is the one they're aiming like big time for. They're going to try to promote Gavin Wimsett as the future. If he looks good in spring game, which I mean, you can't really look bad in the spring game. Um, they're they're going to try to make him look good there. If he looks good in the first couple games of the season, I could see this 2023 class exploding. There's no more limits now. So now it's like all hands on deck. Yeah, I'm excited. It's it's kind of shocking how well they're doing with so many out-of-state kids in the 2023 class, especially like, like a King Williams is top 50 recruit in the country, and he's like probably leaning towards Rutgers right now. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty safe to say. Four-star, top 50, top 60, whatever it is. Um, just paid his own way three times this year. Put it like that. You don't pay your own way from Florida to New Jersey unless you're serious about it. And they, they feel very confident in that one. And you land him, 
it's going to help you land Bryson Rogers, who's choosing, who's not choosing, who has probably Alabama and Rutgers at the top of his list, which is, I don't think we've said that in quite some time. Yeah, that's that's a wild juxtaposition there. Yeah. <laughs> Nick Saban losing out to Shiana. Who would have thought? All right. Oh, it's crazy stuff. But yeah, no, um, I'm dead serious about that nap. I'm going to go take like a three hour nap. <laughs> No, you you deserved it, Richie. Covering two signing days, uh, yeah, a couple one, a couple days worth of sleep too. So go get no that. surprises though. I mean, I know people wanted them, but they didn't have any. So unless you're Florida State, uh... <laughs> Mike Norvell. That oh, I don't even know where to start on that one. The space. Did you join that spaces chat yesterday? I so I didn't join the spaces. I did see a video on Twitter of some guy just like going on like this redneck rant, and then it the guy's hilarious. like, "The sun's gonna wake. The sun's gonna come up in the morning. The birds are gonna chirp. Chill out, man." The, yeah, because the one dude was so depressing. I was asking like, "They're like, all right, we're gonna let this kid speak." And this kid speaks it's like, "Yeah, I don't know, Mike Norvell, man, Florida State. I'm just, it's not just him, you know. Life in general. That guy's like, oh, we'll cut this one off quick." <laughs> Fucking big cats in there, like claiming like he's like, I took you guys to the fiesta bowl, hire me, fuck Norvell. And I'm like, oh, oh geez, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, they've had one hell of a fall from grace since that I can't believe it. Thing. All they keep saying is it's the curse of Willie Taggart. I mean, I think Fisher probably screwed them more than Taggart did. Yeah, but Fisher won a little bit, so it's like Yeah, I mean anybody wins the national title, they probably can get like a free carte blanche pass out of any wrongdoing unless you're ed orgeron you're screwed i mean yeah he did get a nice little paycheck though of course yeah i mean the money who cares but it's like yeah. come on yeah whatever but uh yeah so um i guess that's it i'm gonna end it with uh if you haven't seen the video between brian kelly and walker howard um i highly suggest going to watch it on walker howard's twitter account it is hilarious brian kelly has no idea what he's doing has no rhythm and has no dance moves so Check that out. All right, I need to go check that out right now. It sounds awesome. It's the funniest fucking <laughs> thing I've ever seen. He's just, he tries so hard. And it's just like, you thought this was good and you posted it. I honestly, like, I probably would have decommitted if I saw that. Did you see, uh, <laughs> did you see the, like, the opening, like, press, not press conference, but he, he talked at the, the, LSU basketball game and like he's already trying to talk with like a southern oh, yeah. he's like, fucking like me and my family <laughs> you tackles like, stop like Ed Orgeron fit that school perfectly I don't care what anyone said yep. they, that, they messed up there and they're gonna they're gonna it's gonna come back to bite them when Brian Kelly uh doesn't win shit yeah that's a huge huge paycheck for a guy who's never coached in the south <sighs> yeah well, that's all I got go watch Walker Howard's video it's hilarious All right, guys, this has been another episode of the Night Report podcast. Uh, We are signing off. Thanks for joining us.